This is our sixth FedCap Solution Series, and we are uh, particularly proud uh, of the launching of the Solution Series and really feel like it's a been a tremendous opportunity for us to engage the community, both the business community, the not-for-profit community, the foundation, funder, city agency community in uh, great discussions. We've had so many great discussions uh, since the inception of our Solution Series. For some of you who attend some or all of these, you recall that our um, past solution series included uh, helping individuals or a focus on individuals returning from service here in our community and the extent to which uh, they have a soft landing back in the workplace. Uh, following that was a, a very interesting solution series in which we discussed the plight of individuals who have had some previous incarceration or involvement with the criminal justice system and, and their challenges in reintegrating uh, and back into the community. And uh, for your participation in, in those, um, we are very, very grateful. Our last solution series focused on uh, children who spent any amount of time in the foster care system, you, for those of you who attended. And it was a remarkably helpful discussion, not only to us, but I, I know to other community providers um, who are addressing the needs of older teenagers exiting our system nationwide. And again, we're grateful for the business community, the, funder, the funding community, and the not-for-profits who are out doing this work every day. And um, we are grateful for your participation here. I want to pause for one second and, and just you know have you look around at this tremendous view. Even on a rainy, cloudy day, it just doesn't get better than this. This is a great place to come uh, for a meeting. And in the I know in the back of the room and maybe even sitting here, up oh, here's Tyrone, we have representatives from Mutual of America. By the way, Mutual of America is our provider, our retirement uh, investment provider at FedCap, and we did a long, hard, thorough search, and uh, Mutual of America emerged as our choice uh, because they care tremendously about our employees, many of whom are participants of our program, who make up our uh, almost 1,800 employment um, employees, and the care and attention they provide to our consumers is second to none, and they donate this room twice a year to us and make this available for this discussion at no cost, the food, the coffee, the room, and for that we are uh, remarkably, just remarkable uh, generosity, and we're so grateful. Tyrone, um, I know, I saw Jim, Jim here. The solution series all, all in is really predicated on a, on a belief that if we bring the right people together, a diversified uh, group of people, and we ask the right questions, um, uh, we will, uh, it will lend itself to great solutions, or at least maybe more thorough questions that can be pursued. And um, we have found these uh, discussions to be very, very helpful. I know for our own uh, planning, uh, in terms of the kinds of impact we want to make, I want to um, recognize a number of our board members in the room this morning, I, I like to say our, our board is the hardest working board in, in the nation. We, our chairman, Mark O'Donohue, uh, sitting over here, leads a, a group of board members. We have Ken Reisler in the room. I know uh, Peter Penkin, I saw a board member, a longtime board member in the room. And uh, Lois Wise, our reserve board member in the room. So there may be others. I just want to take a minute and, or, you know, I, when I get the chance to thank our dedicated and committed board because they really do work work day and night to make even things like this possible, but certainly set the agenda. So thank you uh, to the board of FedCap. <laughs> this morning you're, you're joined by 120 uh, individuals from the business and not-for-profit community. I'm uh, very, very hopeful that the discussion uh, uh, is great. And I know for those of you who've been here before, our last uh, person I will mention is Lori Lutz, who has um, uh, facilitated the panel discussion on, on each of these. And while she could easily have been a panelist on any of them, we can't have her as a panelist because no, no one could compete with the job she does in, in facilitating. So thank you for your uh, work. And you'll see what I mean in a few minutes. I want to introduce uh, Laura Trainer, who will um, uh, come up and make some uh, welcoming remarks as well and, and, and really uh, lay out the issue 
um, that we are uh, addressing today. Uh, she is the new director of our ReServe. Uh, we will hear, I'm sure, a little bit about that. Uh, she's also the director of our Community Impact Institute, from which the Solution Series um, uh, um, is launched. So uh, please welcome uh, Laura Trainer. She comes with a, with a great uh, background in, in new generation of older adults and their experiences uh, in the workplace. So please welcome uh, Laura. This might be her first time uh, representing us in this capacity. So thank you, Laura, and welcome. Good morning. Um, thank you, Christine. And yes, I am the new director of Reserve and Ethicap's Community Impact Institute. And for those of you who don't know about Reserve, it's really a phenomenal program that engages older retired professionals um, in meaningful opportunities with nonprofit organizations and agencies. So we have a really great track record. I speak from experience in previous roles with nonprofit organizations. I've employed reservists. So I think I come at today's program from somewhat of a, a unique uh, vantage point in that many of my colleagues over the past several years have been older adults. And uh, for example, I've worked with a 67-year-old retiree from Verizon, and he knew far more about smartphones and computers than I ever will. One of my other colleagues was an 85-year-old 85, 85 woman who, to this day, is creating service-based programs in her community. And another was a 75-year-old woman who uh, could pick up the phone, still at age 75, and reach the CEO of Healthcare Systems. So this morning, you're going to hear more about these types of people, what I like to call a new generation of older adults, who are challenging existing norms of what it means to retire. And we're also going to hear about businesses who are leveraging the experience of these older adults to impact their bottom line. So our panel this morning, our excellent panel this morning, is going to debunk some of the myths and stereotypes and biases surrounding older workers. They're going to delve into some of the real issues that businesses face surrounding um, compensation, knowledge transfer, job structure. And importantly, they're going to share strategies that you can take away with you today to help you better understand how older wor workers can benefit your organization. Um, so it's an exciting panel. It's an exciting topic. I'm happy to meet with any of you interested in learning more about Reserve after the program today or FedCap's Community Impact Institute. But now it's really my pleasure to introduce Lori Lutz, the Chief Strategy Officer at FedCap and really the driving force behind today's program and the Community Impact Institute. Thank you. Good morning. I wanted to um, let you know that while we're 120 strong in the room, we also are live streaming this event throughout the country and the interest has been really quite phenomenal. And I think that's really the touchstone for our event today. 10,000 people are turning 65 every single day. This is what I consider to be um, one of the most productive, disruptive, um, marvelous cohorts ever to hit this country. Just imagine, in 1946, January 1, 1946, when the first baby boomer was born, and if you consider that next major um, onslaught, OBGYNs were overwhelmed, right? And then the hospital delivery rooms, and then kindergarten, and the middle schools, and the high schools, and work, and college. And now, just like they have been disruptive in the most positive and marvelous ways, I shouldn't say they, I am one of them, <clears throat> um, we are this group of marvelous educated individuals, which by the way, they are the most educated generation in the history of our country. And if you want to understand a little bit more about the background, we want to reference the, um, the book that's on your chair, because I think it gives kind of a nice frame for the discussion. What I think is happening now is that this incredible group of individuals are saying our, un our norms and our understanding of what happens when I leave my professional position, they're tipping it upside down. Maybe they're not leaving. Maybe they're changing the way in which they want to work. Maybe they're challenging businesses to change the way they need to work. And so that's what this discussion is about today, to begin to understand what does that look like? What will it look like as we move forward? And so to join us in this discussion, I have had the 
most marvelous time, and I feel so privileged to be able to introduce this panel. And in preparation for these events, I always spend individual time with each panelist, and the conversations are never long enough, and um, I learn from each conversation. So I first want to start out by introducing Dick, Dick Catani. Dick is the chief executive officer of the premier hospitality division of Compass Group, and that's comprised of Restaurant Associates, Flick International, and Wolfgang Puck Catering. The premier division um, provides services, top-notch quality catering services, to a very diverse venue. And some of the clients include the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Bloomberg, Hearst, Google, Lincoln Center, Goldman Sachs, Harvard Business School, World Bank, and the House of Representatives. Dick is a former fellow of the Culinary Institute of America, was honored with the Conti Distinguished Professor Chair at Penn State, a distinguished visiting professor at Johnson and Wales, and a wise professor at the University of Delaware. Dick's also a longtime friend of FedCap, and in 2010 was honored as our Business Partner of the Year. Dick, thanks so much for being here. Dr. Sandra Timmerman is the Corporate Gerontologist for Aging and Business Strategies, and she was the founder of the MetLife Mature Market Institute. Sandra comes to us having participated in what I consider to be some seminal work on the whole issue of aging, decision making. Some of the products that she's been involved in developing are the study of decision making potential, Buddy, Can You Spare a Job that explores strategies for identifying high potential late career workers, and how to engage the 21st century workforce. Sandy was the executive director of the MetLife Institute, and that institute served as the center of expertise, strategy, thought leadership for the 50-plus market. And I think because of Sandy's leadership, MetLife really um, led the curve in the way that they thought about the older workforce. Dr. Timmerman is nationally recognized gerontologist with a focus on um, aging and its relationship to business. And um, finally, I am so pleased to introduce Dr. Kathleen Christensen. Um, Kathleen is the director of the Sloan Foundation's Working Longer program. And anybody who is in this aging space has come rapidly to understand the really cutting edge work that Sloan Foundation is doing. And the whole purpose of the specific area that um, Dr. Christensen leads is to help deepen all of our understanding of aging American work patterns and really understanding and recognizing employer practices that really create obstacles to older workers as well as innovative strategies. And, and I think what's in intriguing to me is the impact on both the individuals and on the state and federal budgets. Interesting. Um, in 94, Dr. Christian was recruited to join the Sloan Foundation, and she also established um, what actually would become a national movement. It's entitled the Workforce, Workplace, and Working Families Program. It's been credited um, with pioneering the field of work family research and really spearheading thinking about flexible workplaces. And we're going to talk to Dr. Christensen about that this morning. Dr. Christensen also planned and prepared um, and participated in the 2010 White House Forum on Workplace Flex Flexibility and the White House Conference on Aging. And this might be my favorite. In 2010, Dr. Christensen was named by Working Mother Magazine one of the seven wonders of the work-life field. Who gets to be called one of the seven wonders? I'm impressed by that. She's a widely quoted expert um, whose editorials have appeared in the op-ed pages of The Post, USA Today, Chicago Tribune, Phil Philadelphia Inquirer, and the Atlanta Constitution. So can you please join me in welcoming this distinguished panel? So I'm going to begin our questions, and the way this will work for those who have not been to a solution series before is we'll have about 40 minutes of trying to pull out the nuggets of wisdom from our panel, and then um, we'll open it up to questions from the audience. And because we are so appreciative of the number of businesses that are in the room, we have a hard stop at 9.30, so we'll rock and roll. Dr. Christensen has our first question, and the question is this. Americans are working longer 
and differently amid evolving notions of age and retirement. What does this mean specifically for the business community, which is watching this profound demographic change in human capital, which is basically its most valuable asset? Thank you, Laurie, and I'm delighted to be here today. I think what's really striking is that there are only two cohorts. Is, is this, it know. feels like it's cutting out. It is. Okay. Um, there are only two cohorts in which the labor force particip participation rates are increasing. And those, are, those two are for one, people between 60 and 64 years of age. And the second is for people over 65 years of age. So the fact is that not only is our population aging, but our workforce is definitely aging. And the trend towards later retirement really began in the mid-1990s. And so since then, for what, the last 17, 18 years, we've been seeing people begin to delay uh, retirement and therefore to extend their working life beyond the conventional ages, the retirement ages of 62 and 64, uh, 65. What has struck me, however, is the degree to which this issue of the aging workforce is not really yet on the radar screen of American businesses. Um, I've sat in meetings with large corporations and medium-sized firms, but one example really hits me, and that is I was sitting with the clients of Mercer, which is a major HR consulting uh, firm, and these were, these were comp and benefits people, these were head of diversity, and they were saying quite candidly, you know, we're really not thinking about the aging of the workforce except to the degree to which we want to have graceful exits. We want to have an orderly progression in the transition from full-time work to full-time retirement. And as a result, it's, it's clear that many firms are not yet doing, particularly large firms, the demographic projections as to where their firm is going to be in the next two, five, ten years in terms of the aging workforce. How many people might they lose? What might be the consequences for institutional knowledge? What might be the consequences for specialized tasks? And how are they going to do a transfer of knowledge? So these kinds of questions will vary from firm to firm, but slowly, I think, we're going to begin to see that this issue of the aging workforce is, and as is evidenced by everyone here in the room today, is going to be of increasing importance. Thanks so much, so much, Kathleen. And I'm going to switch up the questions for a moment because it seems like, Dick, that would be a great issue for you to respond to. Um, actually, you're one of the, your organization, your specific division is a $1.2 billion division. And how are you preparing? Uh, not well. Uh, I think uh, what uh, Kathleen uh, said is true. We're one of the organizations that have really not tackled the issue. It's sort of evolved, and each of the companies within the Compass umbrella are dealing with it differently. I, I can share this with you. When, uh, when we were approaching the recession, we were facing a brain drain. There is no question of people were starting to leave the organization. Once the recession hit, the ground rules changed for our organization. People either by, by need or desire decided to stay on, uh, on their jobs and with the organization much longer than they had anticipated. For us, that was good news because we've been in a growth market and a growth business. And so fortunately, we are um, the beneficiary of that decision by our general workforce. But the, the, the issue of, of, uh, of early retirement or graceful retirement or whatever, we haven't gotten our arms around it. We're, it's just starting to creep on the radar screen. We've been so involved with uh, you know, inclusive, uh, working with an inclusive and better uh, diversified workforce that this topic has not been, uh, been tackled. However, it is now, is now there, front and center, and we've got to figure out what to do because in North America, we have over 220,000 employees. Wow. I mean, it's a huge organization with many moving parts. And so what, what I've been able to do is, is learn best practices from the other sectors within Compass. Yeah. And we've been a, approaching that from, that from that standpoint. And as I said, fortunately, the, the, the workforce has decided to stay in place. What happens next 
is really the $64,000 question. Right, thank you. And that actually leads, Sandra, perfectly to the next question for you. You know, we're, we're hearing and we're reading not only that people's thinking about retirement is very different, but that in fact, people may simply not retire. And I'm wondering, how do you see retirement? Do you have a sense of what it might look like for individuals 10, 15 years from now? Uh, it's a great question, Lori, and I want to build on your introduction because when we say older workers in the business community, I think we have one image, but these are boomers. Yeah. These are the people who remember Woodstock. You know, they were out there to change the world. And uh, I've been finding that this has been going on a long time, this discussion. But right now, uh, boomers are in a position to really force us all, including business, to make some changes. Um, I was in Korea in May for MetLife, and amazingly, there's quite a bit of age discrimination there, which you wouldn't expect in that culture. Uh, and it certainly is pervasive here in many ways. Uh, but what I discovered is that their mandatory retirement age is 58. And they're looking at the imperative of the changing demographics because people aren't having children there yes. and they need these workers, but no one wants to hire them. So I presented a concept to them and I wanted to present it today. Uh, I had a slide and I said in 1900, we had three life stages. We had childhood, adulthood and old age. And then in the 30s, somebody came along and said, gee, an eight-year-old is very different than my 13-year-old. So the discipline of adolescence came along. And then we had childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and old age. And what I'm proposing now in the 21st century is that we really are embarking on a new life stage. So we'll have Childhood, memorize I know, my me too. <laughs> I'm right with you. <laughs> Childhood, adolescence, adulthood, adulthood 2.0, maybe it's encore, maybe it's third age, I don't know what it is, but I'm calling it adulthood 2.0 for now, and if you have a good suggestion for me, let me know. <laughs> and then old age, and what is this adulthood 2.0? Think of people in their 50s, 60s, maybe into their 70s, and think about it functionally. These are people who are vital, they're healthy, they are the best educated generation, they like hard work, and I'll talk about that later, and they see themselves differently, and I think business needs to look at them differently Thank too. You. Thank you so much. Adult 2.0 is gonna be one of our takeaways from the conversation today. So I'm gonna to continue to kind of mix and match our questions. Kathleen, I wanted to ask you this. Under your leadership of the <clears throat> Workplace, Workforce, and Working Families Initiative, the Sloan Foundation, as we indicated, has been credited with spearheading a national movement to improve workplace flexibility. And maybe assuming, and that's always dangerous, that workplace flexibility is one of the keys to the solution to what we're discussing today. What have you learned? What are the characteristics of a flexible workplace, and what, why is that just so critical in this discussion? First off, let me uh, define what we really mean by a flexible workplace. Great. And what some of the fundamental principles of that are. Um, by a flexible workplace, we're really talking about a workplace in which both the, there's something in it for both the employer and the employee. Mm -hmm. This is not an entitlement that just because someone, you know, has a doctor's appointment at four o'clock or has, you know, an elderly parent needs help, that they just automatically get flexibility. It is something that is a strategic business tool. It has to achieve business ends, and, and its essential elements are that it allows more control from the employee side over where, when, and how work is done. So for most people, what they need is the day-to-day -day flexibility, such as having more control over when they can start the day or end the day. Um, it could be compressed work weeks, working a full-time work over four days. It could be part-time, or what we find for many people is what they want is part-year. Um, as I said, fundamental agree ingredient is that it has to work for both the employer and the employee. So when I say control, I'm saying that's a negotiated arrangement. That's, that's not something nice. that just you get. Um, secondly, the w there really has to be a culture of respect and trust around flexibility. Because the reality is that 
people want to work hard. I mean, I would say most people show up wanting to do a good job, but since most people don't have someone at home taking care of everything else, they also come to work having to fulfill you know, other responsibilities, arrange for a plumber, um, take care of a child, take care of an elderly parent, take care of a spouse. So the issue is you know, how that negotiation can happen. So, so there is no one size fits all to flexibility. It's really an issue of fit, what, what fits that person at that point in time, and the demands of the job. And there are real business benefits to this. As I said, it's, I think it's best not to think of flexibility as an accommodation, as a nice to do. It's really yeah. important to think of it as a strategic business tool. And what we have found is that when flexibility is well designed and well implemented, and there's true negotiated agreement between the manager and the employee, um, it can substantially reduce absenteeism. It can reduce attrition and all the costs related to turnover and recruitment and retaining. And it can increase engagement sc uh, scores dramatically in the sense of people feeling really engaged with their work, um, decrease predicted turnover, and then also increase performance. Wow. So that this is, this is a win-win yeah. when properly done. So, Dick, again, I'm going to ask you to respond to that because that really falls in my next question to you is, while this is on the, you know, the cusp of all the work that you're doing in your organization, how do you respond to some of the critical points that Kathleen made regarding flexibility? Yeah, if, if you asked me 15 years ago uh, what was flex scheduling, I'd say I have no idea. Uh, today it's, uh, it's inherent in our business and, 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 and part of our uh, process. So I guess that's the biggest change in our uh, workforce is flex scheduling. Uh, the core business we have is food service at corporations, and so it's a pretty straightforward uh, environment, Monday through Friday, uh, breakfast and lunch. So there's a lot of flexibility there. I mentioned, I mentioned a number of years ago that the workforce, the, the aging workforce has decided to stay uh, with the organization, and that's been the biggest benefit is the flex scheduling. Uh, employees can work four days rather than five. They can work four or five hours rather than eight. And that's, that's been a, a wonderful arrangement for, for both parties in terms of a win-win. But there's more. We've, we've had more people working from home in certain positions. We have more people moving from where they've been to a different part of the organization. You know, how many people uh, that are 70 years old and older that you see in the kitchens today? Very few because it's so demanding. And I, and I view our business as a, uh, I call it young legs, because it is, whether it's a restaurant, catering, or food service, yeah. it's a young person's business because it's so pressurized, it's so physically demanding. So if you want to continue in that world, you have to make some shifts. Yeah. And that's what people have decided to do. And we've accommodated them because we have so, again, we're, we're fortunate to have so many positions because of the gro growth factor. And different uh, skill levels have changed. We're now moving people into two segments that didn't exist 10, 15 years ago, two business lines, uh, which is plant management, which is cleaning services and uh, patient movement and that sort of thing. So people have moved from food service into that genre. So it's been a, uh, it's been a good situation for, for both parties. You know, I was thinking about, Kathleen, your comment about the idea of uh, maybe working partial year, and that almost uh, speaks of job sharing. Dick, is that something that... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right on the money, actually, for us. Uh, case in point, we just finished uh, the, the the U.S. Open, the Tennis Open at Flushing Meadow. We have employees that have worked for us for 15 years, for two weeks a year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Many of them are housewives, for example, and they've aged over this 15 years, but they continue to come back because it's ideal. They make good money, they work very hard, and then it's over. Uh, if I go back 10 years ago, the, uh, we did the Olympics at Salt Lake City, wow. which is, was a big, big undertaking for us. In fact, it was the first time a food service company did the athlete feeding, the concessions, and the catering. Wow. So we had thousands to hire, and we had uh, many people that we called back from retirement to say, do you want to work three weeks? Yeah. And they did. It was an exciting adventure for them. Yeah. Uh, hurricane relief in the south primarily, Florida, the Keys. Uh, the Gulf states. Uh, every time that situation happens, we have to mobilize to provide food service and relief. Where do we go? We go to the people that did this for so many years and bring them back for those number of weeks. Oh, that's so an interesting strategy. Yeah. yeah. So, 
um, Kathleen and Dick have started to really talk about the ways in which the workplace can think differently about um, the engagement of older workers. And yet, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Timmerman about the issue of um, bias. So um, one of the things that we've learned in doing the research, and you in your engaging the 21st Workforce paper, suggests that companies can cultivate a management style and a workforce culture that is respectful of all workers, but some managers are simply fearful of older workers. And we literally heard HR director after HR director, um, and they don't want to have themselves named, say that I have to be honest. When an older individual walks in the room, I have to, if I'm aware of it, consciously combat my biases. And some do and some don't. And so my question to you is, what do managers need to know about the boomer generation in order to combat that bias? Well, good question, of course. <laughs> um, workforce engagement is what we studied of all generations. So we looked at Gen Y, Gen X, and the boomers, both the younger and the older. And we uh, focused on engagement. And what does that mean? I'll read part of the quote. It's a positive connection with work that motivates an employee to get the job done with excellence because the work energizes them. And that's what employers really want. So what we found is that older workers, who remember are boomers primarily, had higher levels of engagement than younger workers. And I might mention that we had worked with another Sloan Center, the Center on Aging and Work, and used a database of large corporations and some mid-sized corporations in various fields. So these were uh, full-time workers primarily. Uh, this is interesting to me. Uh, more hours of work correlated with higher engagement for the boomers. Oh, interesting. Oh. And I heard a speech one day, and the man said, if a boomer does a good job, you say, gee, that's great. Let me give you another assignment. If a Gen Y does a good job, you say, that was great. Take the afternoon <laughs> off because they were going to do it anyway. <laughs> so you know, keep that in mind as an employer. And then the other thing that correlated with engagement was supervisor support. Uh, and interestingly enough, not in that study, but another one we did, the age of the supervisor didn't matter. It was really the support. So for employers, uh, some strategies might be to really think about boomers who want to be involved in teams and want uh, the support. You know, they're, they're going to be out there doing terrific work. They're not on a career ladder, which is good. They yeah. want to do a good they job. Do the work. But we need to give uh, supervisors some resources. And uh, the other thing uh, is that I would say interesting, challenging assignments. I think our bias sometimes says, well, you know, they're doing that, and we're, we have some new things we're trying, customer centricity, but, you know, that worker may not be here very long. I think the boomers are totally turned on by this. Remember, they like work. Thank you so much. That's a really important thing. This is a high work ethic generation. And so I want to te um, tease that out a little bit more, Kathleen. You actually learned and or, um, uh, were made me aware of a study out of Germany that actually posed a research question. How do you best harness the productivity of older workers? And what was learned in this study? Yeah, this is a fascinating study, and, and nothing comparable has yet to be done in the United States um, because of lack of data, basically. Um, but the study basically is, as Lori said, you know, how do you harness the, the productivity of older workers, and how do you have ensure that they stay with the firm and hence work longer. And they examined a number of different um, conditions. One was formal training to everyone. Second was specialized training for older workers, such as you know, in, in technology. Um, the third was phased retirement, which by definition actually has an endpoint. And then the fourth was mixed age teams. Mm -hmm. And they found very clearly that although no one anticipated the impact of it, the mixed age teams were the most effective way to harness the productivity of older workers and to keep them engaged and employed. And you know, I, I, I found that interesting. And the more I thought about it, I thought, well, you know, it makes sense. It does. because. Most people learn on the job. They want to learn from one another. So when you have a mixed-age team, people are really bringing 
different skills, different experiences, different insights to the table. And, and so rather than just having a training program, this actually enables people to have informal training and to learn from each other. There was another German study that actually looked at what could be done to, to sustain productivity levels on uh, the plant floor when the workforce was, was aging. And it was a, it was a, a Mercedes BMW mm -hmm. plant. Um, and what they found was just slowing down the line by a few seconds kept the pro productivity stable. And I think the importance of that is that oftentimes as people age, maybe eyesight you know, is not as good, maybe glare affects eyesight, maybe you know, hand motor coordination may be off by a couple seconds. But by looking at small ergonomic tweaks, in other words, just small things that could be done to the, 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 the work site or the work processes, could end up um, you know, having great returns. I love that piece because we were talking last night at dinner about the idea that certainly as you age, you slow down. I mean, for my mother, I haven't seen that. But for the most part, people start to slow down. And just these slight little tweaks actually changes the work dynamic so that slow down doesn't impact productivity. What I loved um, about your comment about the multi-generational teams is something that um, Dick and I talked about in our, in our, con, our call to prep for this, that th there's something fascinating about that millennial generation that we all are aware of. And um, the multi-generational team can have, as the study showed, incredible benefits. It can also be challenging. And Dick, what are some of the yeah, challenges? I, I guess I have to be careful about what I say because there are some uh, millennials here today. <laughs> but uh, they are it is uh, there are there are benefits. There's no question. I mean, uh, having uh, a mixed age uh, workforce is the uh, is really the best you can hope for. Uh, the energy and the youth, and of course the the wisdom and the stability and experience uh, blended together. However, uh, our middle aged, middle management workforce is struggling managing the millennials. And it's become a, a serious issue across the board in every one of our sectors, whether it's food for service, plant management, or what have you. So what we've had to do is really create some a significant and focused training programs for our middle-aged, middle management workforce. And that's been going on for three years. It has clearly helped. But it is still a challenge. There's no question. It's a different point of view on the uh, on work habits or work ethic. It's uh, there's a t diff different point of view of, of what it requires. In our business, you know, we open a new business, you've got to work weekends. You've got to work stretches of many, many days. And uh, it's the, the, uh, the, the older workforce doesn't question it. They jump in and do whatever it takes. The younger for workforce questions it and says, do I really have to work Sunday? It's my day off. And we'll, you say, well, we're opening a restaurant tomorrow morning. Well, I want to take Sunday off. It is that dilemma you constantly face, and it's, uh, it's a challenge. There's Thank no question. You. Kathleen, did the German study talk about specifically what, um, the way one could structure a multi-generational team that could begin to address some of the things that Dick was just referencing? No, I think what Dick is referencing is absolutely, absolutely essential. But you know, the, the nature of research is you know you work with the data available, yeah. and the data didn't allow for that kind of drilling down. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know that a number of companies really have formal mentoring programs, reverse mentoring, exactly. uh, reverse sponsorship, mm -hmm. so that people buy into it. But that doesn't really address what Dick is saying about you know. Uh, what happens when there's just very, and I wouldn't say it's a different work ethic necessarily because I think the millennials, re, re, I have two daughters who are in that age group, they really want to show up and work hard. Mm -hmm. But they've seen their parents oftentimes give their whole life to their work and then be laid off. And so I think they have a different philosophy in the sense of, you know, I, I really want to work hard, but I don't want to sacrifice my whole life to work. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to have, although I don't believe there ever is balance, but I, 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 you know, they may say I want to be able to, to make sure I, I have a personal life. I don't want to sacrifice that on the altar of the workplace because I may lose my job and I don't want to be then without something else in my life. You bet. If I could just share. Yeah. Uh, so our business is a global business, so I'm fortunate to sit on a, a panel of uh, the top 10 countries in the world as a best practice process, and I've been doing that five years, and it's just fascinating. 
I can assure you, the other nine countries that I interface with think we're nuts. We work too hard, we don't take enough vacation time, we don't take holidays, we don't take care of our families, on and on and on. And uh, it's really interesting to see culturally yeah. how they view work and how we, in general, how we yeah. uh, view work. And yeah. I think the millennials are more aligned <laughs> with the rest of the world rather than the older generation here. Well, well, in some ways though, I think though that in some ways the older generation and, and I guess I'm now in that, um, are aligned with the millennials in the sense that you hear them saying, hear us say, you know, I want to work, but I may not want to work full year. I may not want to work yeah. full week. So I think that the fact that the older generation is beginning to think about their contract with the work in the workplace um, may actually open up the conversation broader within many firms because this is not a gendered issue. It's not just, oh, it's a mommy issue. This is men as well as women who yeah. are saying this. And, and these older workers have seniority and status within the firm. And so I actually see some alignment among not all. We can't just generalize about all older workers. Yes. No doubt. But I think that th there is some alignment between the bookend generations. So that's an incredible point of leverage. If we can think about how to structure teams in that way, that's an incredible point of leverage. One of the things that I think is so interesting is um, that there are perspectives, again, about older generations that some millennials may come with, some middle um, age individuals may come with, some of us in this room might hold. And, um, you know, Sandra, we hear statements like senior moments and all of the kind of phrases that we hear, but MetLife did a study which I found fascinating on healthy decision making. And, and the reason I wanted to tee into this a little bit is because there is a, a wisdom and an asset base in the older generation that um, we would be, I think, unwise to, to miss or to lose. Can you talk about yeah, that? And I just wanted to comment on the other conversation. I yeah. think teamwork kept me young. You know, it keeps the older workers sharp and it keeps the younger workers tuned into what you can do. Yes. Because you're working on an idea, even though they're totally different and I don't get the behavior sometimes. <laughs> but um, I, we did this study, it was sort of my pet peeve because in the financial services industry, there's a, a theory that people are declining in their ability to think after age 45. Yes. And I know that's not true being a gerontologist. So we uh, worked with a center, a uh, brain health center in, in Texas, the University of Texas, and we studied people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. And what we actually found is if you remove people who have uh, any cognitive impairment, which a number of studies have done in the past, have included that group inadvertently, people who have healthy brains, who are healthy older adults, really uh, do not have declines. They are logically consistent like younger people. There's no difference. And that means that when presented with the same information twice in different ways, they come up with the right answer. Their strategic learning capacity actually increases with age, and strategic learning is being able to sift out the unimportant from the important. And I think that really is a key ingredient yeah. of age and wisdom, maybe not wisdom, but certainly the ability to do that. Uh, and then we also found that these strategic learners were less likely to be victims of risky options because we found that in other studies they had done of younger, younger people make quicker decisions, but they're not really weighing the options. So there's more conscientious decision making going on. We may find that older people can't memorize lists. They have you know, a more difficult time quickly absorbing numbers, but I think for the business environment today, Computers can do that. We need these kinds of decision-making wow. skills. Thank you. Excellent. Mm. I have more questions for our panel, but time is, uh, is um, going away. And so I'd like to turn to the audience and say, what questions might you have for this panel that um, might advance your own environment, your own business world? Bill, thank you. I think the panelists who are all <coughs> looking at this, <coughs> excuse me, from the perspective of employers, 
from the employee perspective, the increase, how much of the uh, increase in work, older workers is a result of necessity. They don't necessarily want to work, but because of increasing income gaps, they find themselves having to work. And is that, is that really what we want in this country? Oh, interesting. If the question is, uh, if, that's, if that's a reality, it is a reality. Uh, and uh, how long they stay in the position, we're not quite sure. But, but we benefit from it because of the, uh, the knowledge of, of what they bring to the table. So it's stabilized our business. We've been able to grow with a workforce that knows our culture, knows our business. And so it's been extremely helpful. But clearly, there's a, there's a group of people that need to work. They have to work because of the environment, because of financial obligations. Kathleen. Um, in some of the survey work, it's been almost 50-50. 50% of people say that they're really doing it because they like the social engagement, they like staying active, they like maintaining their identity, and 50% say it's out of need. And, I, and certainly, that latter group has grown since the onset of the Great Recession. Um, having said that, however, when we look at the statistical patterns, most people who are working longer are more highly educated. So clearly, they have uh, more opportunities in the workplace. Um, what I was very chagrined to, to hear the other day was that one, 26 percent, so a little, one out of four high school dropouts are now on Social Security disability insurance. So they didn't, they either wow. have been hurt or they're using SSDI as a transition to Medicare or they, you know, they, they, that's the retirement scheme. So the reality is that when we talk about older workers, and I think this goes to, to your point, we really have to disaggregate. Yeah. There is no monolithic yeah. class of older workers. Which is your point. And Sandra, that fits in perfectly with the mm -hmm. adult uh, 2.0. Yeah, yeah, and I, I also uh, have, have a thought on this too. Some of our other research has shown that we as employers have to get people started thinking sooner about having a longer career life. And it may not be with the same employer, but right. we really need to lay the groundwork because this is not going to go away. Yes. Right. And you look at the savings rates, I mean, coming from financial services, they're dismal for many people. Right. Uh, many people still want to be productive and useful. That always comes out to be at least a quarter of all the research that we do. People say that, and so they're not mutually exclusive. But if we can really put this into our work-life programs, our training, and get people to think about, maybe they want to go into a nonprofit field, maybe they want to do something specialized, because we are finding that the people who tend to get hired later in life have the specialty. Yes. And they're the ones who are more marketable rather than the general you know, middle managers. So people have to start thinking that way, and employers can help. Yes, Kathleen, please. Um, just to, to that point about the economic security, um, half of all Americans die with no assets. I mean, that includes no house, no nothing. Um, so th there is a real profound issue around the economic security of, of us Americans as we age. Um, and, and related to that, as an economist at Stanford, John Chauvin says, we cannot support 30-year retirements with 40-year yeah. careers. Yeah. So the reality is that, like it or not, most people are going to need to work. We've had a conversion to, for, you know, to defined contributions away from defined benefits. People are taking on more risk. And, as, and so to, to your point, Sandy, uh, the, the issue really has to be on the radar screen of employers because there is a supply that's growing, and the issue is, is there going to be comparable demand? I'm going to remember that statement. Um, the, you cannot support a 30-year retirement with a 40-year career. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Lois, please.
Thank you. That was a good question. <laughs> Who wants to jump on that one? I think it's a great question. I'll never give up an airspace for that. Uh, you know, it is really different because when I think about the corporations, people have been worked there from their life, their whole life was in the same corporation. That doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. And I think that's why the boomers, many of them are shocked because they put their blood, sweat, and tears into one company. And millennials, as you mentioned, are not... Uh, really expecting that to happen to them. So maybe that is something to do with their work habit. I think it also has to do with the way they're raised, <laughs> myself, yeah. in a way their peers, you know, they're, they're, um, they're, they're a little, I don't know whether anyone has seen some of these movies like Meet the Fockers and this kid comes in and he says, oh, your parents are so thrilled, you have a blue ribbon. And he said, gee, I didn't know I could get a blue ribbon for coming in ninth. Ninth. <laughs> yeah, that's so yeah. true. And I actually talked to someone in the MetLife HR department. The mother called up the HR department when his, her son got a bad evaluation. So yeah. believe me, that never happened in the boomer yeah. era. I should so so too. Yeah. Those are just <laughs> incidental yes. uh, comments. Yeah. But yeah. since I had the space, I thought I'd mention it. And you Dick, probably please. have yeah, a I think idea. I, I mean, my, my view is that the millenniums are not looking for the, a company to take care of them as their, as their parents were taking care of. The, the, the statistic I read the, preparing for this uh, uh, today is that the boomers, uh, in the course of their career, had four to six jobs. I think six was pretty high. The millenniums, every two years. So it's a whole different view on, uh, on working for someone. And, and many of them want their own business. They want to be their own boss. And so they're striving for that. So I think it's a totally different philosophy for both generations. Please. Thank you, Dick. Thank you, Al. Hello. Uh, Emily Allen, AARP Foundation. I just have a question. Um, considering I'm hearing comments about the bias of older American workers, is there any way we can come in a collaboration to ensure that older Americans are going to be able to work even in the coming the upcoming millennium without feeling like they're being pushed aside? Is there a way we can come up with some kind of solution to help the companies overcome their bias about older American workers? Interesting. Kathleen, I, yes, please. I don't have the magic bullet. Um, but I think, you know, one of the biases is older workers cost too much. And I think the reality is that there is some evidence for it. So I think tackling the evidence head on is important. Um, Medicare is now the secondary payer for anyone who works at 65 or older. If Medicare was a primary payer for people 65 and older, it would cost the employers a lot less. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and it would cost the government more, but people would continue to pay payroll tax and pay income tax and everything else. So, you know, it would be important to really do that cost-benefit analysis. That's a analysis. great analysis um, request. You know, so, and, and the other factor is, is that employers oftentimes feel that they cannot change the wage tenure productivity equation. That, you know, as people work longer, they earn more, and they're just going to keep earning more. And, um, and many employees would rather kind of sever that. They'd say, I'd like to continue working, but I don't want a job with as much demands. I don't want a job that's going to, I'm going to have to travel nonstop. And so if there was a way of thinking creatively and productively about, well, how people could downshift without incurring any legal risk, you know, without, so I think that, you know, and then there's other forms of just ageism that's on the workplace. And I think part of it is holding up a mirror and saying, you know, we see this. So like, I have a project under consideration right now from psychologists at Princeton who've been doing some really interesting work that the New York Times wrote about a few months ago on ageism. Yes. And so I think sometimes these are such embedded and unconscious um, biases that we have to really make the implicit very explicit. And when people are aware of it, it's hard to stop it, but at least you can sometimes put a break on it. Thank you so much. We are running out of time. So first of all, would you please join me in thanking our panel and in welcoming. <laughs> And in welcoming Mark O'Donohue, our board chair. Thank you, Mark. Hi, everyone. 
This has been a fantastic discussion. I mean, every single comment here has sort of sparked ideas in my own mind. You know, it's fascinating to talk, listen to people talking about you. So, you know, and, and if it's not you today, it's going to be you in the future. But uh, the hallmark of these sessions is that we end on time. So 9.30 is here. I want to thank everybody for attending. And again, thank you to our panelists and to Lori for moderating a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you.